Hello, everybody. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, Dr. Jenny Grant Rankin has two doctorates, a PhD and an LHD, which I've already made a weak joke about, and just completed a five-year tenure as a Fulbright specialist for the U.S. Department of State. She has lectured at such institutions as the University of Cambridge, teaching the postdoc master class, the University of Oxford, St. Anne's College, and most recently Ivy League at Columbia University, teaching a class for its Safe Lab Research Initiative. She delivers keynote plenary presentations at conferences and teaches workshops for researchers, educators, federal agents, and others on the brain, data, and the best ways to share information. She also speaks at non-academic venues such as TED, has authored 14 non-fiction books, and writes an ongoing blog column for Psychology Today. Dr. Rankin was honored multiple times by the US White House, and the American flag was once flown over White House Capitol building in honor of Dr. Rankin. Her media appearances include the British Broadcasting Corporation, HuffPost, the Los Angeles Times, National Public Radio, NBC News, Newsweek, the New York Times, O, the Oprah Magazine, Reader's Digest, The Sun, US News and World Report, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, and Congressional Testimonies to Inform Legislation. She also volunteers for Mensa, of which she is a lifetime member. So excuse another weak joke, but here's Jenny. Hi, everyone. It's so great to be here and, and see all of your faces. I so appreciate you all being here. We're going to be talking about your intelligent brain today. Um, so if you are a Minson or if you are a potential Minson, it's such a great group that if you're considering it, I hope you join. Um, everybody always thinks of that as, oh, oh, you're lucky. You know, things will be easy for you. Life will be easy because you're so smart. Uh, but as we all know, there are some quirks that come from having this super fast, super powerful brain. And it can be a little stressful if you don't know much about those quirks and you just know that you're a little bit different or maybe your, your behavior is a little off or your thinking's a little, a little quirky. Um, but once we we know more about these things and about why our brain is doing them and what's going on. I personally, I find it um, just it, it invigorating. It's so exciting to know, oh, that's what's going on. Um, and it just makes life a, a lot easier when we understand it better. Um, so today I'll be talking about some of these strange things that are happening in your mind if you have a high IQ, as those on this talk do. Um, so I'm going to start with the things that we're more likely to maybe know about. I'm going to talk about twice exceptionality and then move gradually into things we might not know as much about. For example, OEs or overexcitabilities, and then just this big category of, of things that make us sort of, oops, things can go wrong um, be, because of these these special quirks. So to start out, um, I'm going to talk about two E's, but keep in mind all of these things that we talk about today, they're happening simultaneously all the time. Um, so it can it can result in some pretty, pretty strange thoughts or behaviors. So let's start with 2E. That's an abbreviation for twice exceptional. And I'll be having you use the chat feature throughout the talk. So um, for me, it depends on your computer setup, but mine's at the bottom of my screen. I can just um, click it to open it, but you might have to click some dots or click more or you know, find it somewhere else. But uh, if you find your chat thing, that's where you can be asking questions as we go that we'll get to at the end. Um, and, or even if you just want to chime in, like that's something, this is something you know about or have a comment, that's fine too. So twice exceptional. What that means is that someone is gifted. They have an IQ of say 130 or above, but they also at the same time 
have some challenges that can interfere with their learning. Um, for example, when I was in elementary school, I had a speech impediment and it interfered with my spelling. Uh, so that would be an example of twice exceptionality. And I want you to make a guess for me. Um, what percent of gifted people do you think also have some sort of learning challenge? Please type it in the chat for me. What percent do you think? 10% of, of gifted individuals are twice exceptional? Do you think 70% are twice exceptional? Give me a guess there. Oh, good. Thank you all for your participation. This is awesome. Awesome to see. Nice. And you'll notice we have a range of responses and the research is like that too. It's actually somewhere in this zone. Different studies come out with different percents. Some insist it's only two and a half percent. Some insist it's 36 percent. It's probably a, it's probably a little higher in the within this range. Uh, but one of the reasons it's so hard to know is because if you're highly gifted, often your learning challenge is masked. People maybe don't know that you have dysgraphia because you, you're memorizing the numbers and whatnot, or maybe it's the other way around. Often, if someone has a learning challenge, their giftedness is masked. Maybe they're dyslexic and they're performing poorly on, um, but, it, but it's, it's really because it's, it, their giftedness is being masked by the challenge. So it's a it's a hard one to know. Um, but I want to kind of explain why it's not always so bad if you're just wired a little bit differently. I was doing some work with UCI where we were looking at brain scans. And we were looking at brain scans of people who didn't have dyslexia, the control group, and scans from people who did, who were dyslexic, and looking at what was going on in their brains while they were reading. And when we looked at the dyslexic individual scans, you can see there was way more activity in areas on neural pathways that the rest of us weren't using, and in some cases didn't even have. So that different wiring, it can it can seem bad and it can lead to some struggles, but it can also lead to some things that are very beneficial. And that's why now we talk about, instead of so much learning challenges, we talk about in terms of neurodiversity, having these different brains. Um, I wanna give you one example. Octavia Butler. Does anyone you can put in chat? Does anybody know what uh, what what she's famous for? Octavia Butler. Do you know her? Okay. Uh, yay, sci-fi. You got it. Yes, she was the first science fiction author to ever win the MacArthur what's called the Genius Grant, um, and it was for her science fiction writing. She's won the the um, Nebula Award. The um, Hugo Award, she's a fantastic science fiction writer, and she is also dyslexic. Um, and you might think, oh my gosh, you know, I think dyslexic, I don't think writer, um, but she is just so gifted, so creative that really she she pushes through and she's able to overcome those challenges and be successful. And she's in good company. Um, dyslexics are have are dis there's a disproportionately high representation of them amongst uh, those who in very creative fields like engineers, designers. Anyone who can think outside the box, there's a higher percentage amongst successful entrepreneurs. <laughs> and you'll notice this in the names of other famous people who are dyslexic. You'll notice each of these individuals really, <laughs> their success was partly due to the fact that they could really think outside the box with those those extra neural pathways. Um, there's also El Shea. Um, now he was so many things. Uh, he was a guerrilla warfare leader, a military strategist. He was also a diplomat, a physician, an author. He did so much. And how did he do it all? He most likely had ADHD and he's in good company. Um, there are many um, great minds, um, very gifted individuals have also had ADHD. Um, and you'll notice a commonality <laughs> that these individuals were so prolific. And you think, well, how did they do it? Well, they just, they could really jump to all these different areas and it they could really use that, that, 
the ways in which they were neurodiverse as a superpower. There's also Temple Grandin. Um, are you familiar with Temple Grandin? Yes. Some of, yes, some of you might have seen that. I, I still haven't seen, and I'm I'm a vegan and, and I love animal rights, uh, but I still haven't seen that Julia Stiles movie. Um, that she's she's just fantastic. Um, she was an animal behaviorist or and has done so many, so many great things for <coughs> animals and for society. And she is on the autism spectrum. Um and for what's what's interesting, especially when you look at others who who were most likely on the spectrum as well, is often uh, those who are autistic are maybe less sensitive to social cues. And while we can think of that as ooh disability, we can also think so often that's part of the reason why they were able to speak up and push push for change to <laughs> everyone else kind of going along with the norm. So they, they took that neurodiversity and used it as a superpower. Um, so we've talked some about twice exceptionality, and now I'm going to talk about OEs or overexcitabilities. Has anyone heard of these before? You can chime in yes if um, if anyone's heard of them. Um, I'm, I'm shocked how often even those in charge of gifted programs in school districts don't know about OEs. Um, overexcitabilities, they've been around for a while. Uh, the researcher was from Poland. He just passed away in 1980. Uh, Dabrowski, he's, he laid the foundation of research on OEs that, that still holds up to even today. Uh, he also is known for his research into existential depression. And that's no accident, as we know that those who are highly gifted are often more prone to depression. And we'll talk a little bit more about that too. Uh, but he really laid the foundation on these. And what these are, I'm, I'm going to really oversimplify it here, but think your brain, if you're highly intelligent, your brain is supercharged. You are firing on all cylinders and something that active and that powerful sometimes lets out that energy in other unexpected ways. Now, there are five overexcitabilities and everyone who has an IQ of 130 and above. So that means all of you on this on this talk here have at least one. Most of you have multiple, and you might have all five. I have all five of these. And when, as we learn about them, you'll really get some big ahas on why your brain does as certain things. It's not that the smarter you are, the more OEs you have, but it's that once you're over that 130 cutoff, you just definitely have at least one, usually multiple, and possibly all five. Now, I could spoon feed you what each of these is, but you're a smart group, and I thought it'd be fun to instead make this a game. So instead of just feeding you what each of these means, I want you to look at the words. There are five of them. They're at the bottom of your screen. And I want you to kind of just by the way they sound, you know, your Latin roots and whatnot, try to take a guess at what you think that might be. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about two people. There'll be five phases to the game, one for each overexcitability. And I'm going to flash up two faces. One of them's fictional. One of them's real. And I'm going to just talk about them for a little bit. And while I'm talking about them, I'm hitting on the things that are a result of this particular overexcitability. And then I'd like you to please guess in the chat field while I'm describing the two people, start guessing in the chat field which of the overexcitabilities you think I'm describing. So that's how we're going to learn about these five OEs. And then I'll tell you, of course, what the correct answer is. Uh, so first up, I'm dating myself here. One of my heroes when I was growing up was Pippi Longstocking. Anybody else? Can I see in the chat field a yes, a thumbs up? Do you know who Pippi Longstocking is? Did anyone else watch this? Yay! <laughs> I'm in good company then. I love Pippi. So I'm going to talk about her. I'm going to talk about Octavia Butler again. 
And as I do, I want you to guess in the chat field which overexcitability you think I'm describing, okay? Okay, we know Octavia Butler, so creative, so able to think outside the box. Same thing with Pippi. She always could dream up the most imaginative, fun, fun games to play, things to do. She was also often daydreaming. Remember, they're riding along in the train and she's just daydreaming. Um, that can get people with this overexcitability into trouble if they, they kind of space out during school. I'm a big spacer outer. I do this quite a lot. They also, lots of times they're just doodling instead of taking notes. Um, sometimes they're messy. That's not me, but I know it is for others. Um, and I can see, um, I see everybody chiming in and you got it right. It's imagination. There's an overexcitability, imaginational, and as I described, it can be, a, it can come with great things. You dream great things up. It can also cause maybe messiness, daydreaming, spacing out, zoning out, that sort of thing as well. Um, and if, if this is anybody, feel free. I say somebody even says that was me. Feel free to chime in if you think this is you as well. Because remember, at least one of these things I talk about is going to be you too. Uh, so next up, I talked a bit about El Shea and all the things he achieved. And also Tony Stark is an example of this overexcitability. He spoke very quickly. Um, he was also always on the go, always staying up late, working on projects, because this overexcitability can manifest itself verbally and or physically. For me, it's both, but it's not, not for everybody. Sometimes these folks can be impulsive, like a student in class might suddenly throw a paper ball across the room and kind of not know why, just very impulsive, sudden, the, the movement, the, the fast talking. Um, and I've already seen it. I've seen everyone guessing. And yes, we've got a smart group. It is psychomotor that I'm describing. They might have others as well. Like they might have the, I see, you know, intellectual, emotional, that the one I was specifically describing psychomotor, which is probably poor branding for, for that overexcitability because it's such a bad sounding. I've told people before, I think they have psychomotor and, and they look at me like I'm insulting them. Um, so it, it definitely doesn't have the best name, but um, yeah, that's, that's the one that we're talking about there. And for this next one, I'm going to talk about uh, Dr. Neil um, deGrasse Tyson, who, as we all know, astrophysicist, phys inc incredible genius. Um, I've also seen, though, um, and he has a reason to be confident. You know, he's amazing. Uh, but I've also um, or heard in an interview where he kept he kept jumping ahead to what he thought the um what he thought the reporter was going to say uh, or the interviewer and and it wasn't right but he he kept thinking he, he had the answers on that um i should say though interrupting people is is often a psychomotor trait uh, i know it's one i struggle with um but very confident this overexcitability here oops I got to move it so you guys can see the names of them. This overexcitability often comes with a lot of confidence. We saw that with Hermione, Grain Hermione Granger. I've got her picture from the movies and her picture from st on stage. Um, Hermione sometimes rubbed the other students the wrong way because they thought she was she was too arrogant or too kind of too much of a know it all. Um, so that that can sometimes happen. Um, but this overexcitability, they ask deep questions. They're in insatiably curious. They want to know everything about a topic. If they discover there's a gap in knowledge on a, something they, they care about, they are researching it like crazy. They don't necessarily do well in school like all the indiv these, these individuals I'm showing you obviously did great in school. Uh, but sometimes in school, they just they're bored by what's being taught, but then they go home and they you know, memorize all the NASCAR stats or, or whatever it is. So sometimes it relates to academics and sometimes it doesn't, but they just, they research everything. They want to know why when they were little kids. And um, I don't know if you were like this, I was, they drove their parents crazy saying, why, why? Okay, but why? Yeah, I want to know why. <laughs> questions, questions, questions. Oh, I love, I love all the comments here. Um, and from from how you've been answering, I think you got it right too. It was intellectual, the intellectual overexcitability. It's this insatiable need 
to know um, the answer to something. And next step, anybody watch Big Bang Theory? I, I love Big Bang Theory. And I, I think a lot of us relate to the characters in Big Bang Theory. Uh, now for this overexcitability, I'm going to talk about Raj from Big Bang Theory. And I'm going to talk about the great, hilarious and wonderful uh, host, Ellen DeGeneres. Um, and I'll tell you aspects of them that relate to this overexcitability. Raj would get so like if he in the early seasons, if he encountered a woman, this just this blockage would come up. He'd get so nervous and he couldn't even speak in the presence of a woman. He was just incapacitated. Um, if he had a, a breakup, he was into that. You know, he was having his ice cream. He was crying. He was uh, he was you know, couldn't stop talking about it. Just like this photo says it all. Um, Ellen, she's known for being such a giving, charitable person. When she found out animals were being mistreated, instantly became a vegan and never looked back. I did the same thing when I was young, became vegan. It was decades ago, never looked back uh, because they, they hear about something and they just have to do something about it. For example, you're walking down the street with somebody and you pass a homeless person, someone with, you know, maybe your, your companion is, oh, that's sad. And then moves on what's for lunch today. Whereas if you have this overexcitability, you were thinking, what? What's, um, you know, where are they going to sleep tonight? What, why do some people have and some don't and, and, and so on. And I see that you've all been guessing correctly. It's the emotional overexcitability. Um, it's the reason you might have a student who, who cries because she can't sit in her favorite chair. They're just, everything is, is just a, a lot more emotional. And then finally, do I have any fellow Game of Thrones fans? Anyone like Game of Thrones. Tyrion is one of my favorites. Uh, he and Arya Stark are my favorites. Um, but he, uh, well, I'll talk about this overexcitability along with Kanye West. Um, and this overexcitability in particular, um, Tyrion, he loved his wine and his women, especially in the, in the, you know, beginning books. Uh, for for Kanye West, he it does so much um tied to this this overexcitability, his, his music, the, the sounds that he pulls out and, and dreams up and works with. And then he's also involved in design and fashion and picking the fabrics and the colors and, and all of that. And I, you guys have it correct. It's the sensual overexcitability. This is, this is a hard one for teachers to spot. The parents usually are, are more privy to this kind of knowledge about, about students. But this happened to me, and I don't know if it happens to any of you or happens to me. I cannot have a tag in my clothes ever. I am just like this. If I have a tag, I'm so distracted by it. Um, often people wear their headphones a lot because they're just trying to block out the noise. Oh, I see someone said five of five. Oh, I, I love that you're all connecting to this because that's exactly how I felt when I first learned about it. And it just gave me so many answers about why I am the way I am. And as we know, I, there's a great segue, five out of five. I have all five. Often people have all five. I believe Kanye West has all five. And when we look at, for example, when he stormed the stage of, at the VMAs to, to take that microphone from Taylor Swift, and we all thought, what is he thinking? But you can see a lot of these overexcitabilities were on overdrive in that moment. Doesn't explain some other things he's done, but, but we can see, oh, uh, you know, he was emotional in that moment. He thought he was correcting an injustice. Um, he was thinking outside the box of how the other, you know, how the judges were thinking. Um, he had really thought about this topic and who deserved it, Beyonce. Um, and the psychomotor, the impulsive, storming that stage. And as we just covered, we know he's got that sensual overexcitability. So, so these can all come together and result in some strange behavior, especially if, if we're unaware. So it's great to be aware of them. Oh, I'm loving, I'm, I'm just loving how you're all connecting with this. Um, and then lastly, we're going to go into these, a whole range of, I just call them oops, things that are happening in everyone's brains. But for us with these supercharged brains, 
it's it really goes into overdrive and there there's some some cognitive quirks that we're particularly susceptible to having high IQ. And so first just to lay the foundation, I'd like to talk about behavioral economics and the late great Danny Kahneman who he just passed away in March. Uh, he was the first psychologist to ever win a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, he was just fantastic. Oh, and I can share. I see. I'm oh, sorry. I'll get to the. I'll get to the questions later. <laughs> but I. But I can share slides later if anybody wants that. Um, but Danny Kahneman. He is the one that. Um, well, he and Tversky. They laid the foundation of what's called behavioral economics, and it's just the economics of our brain and behavior where our brain is trying to be efficient and I'll go into what happens as a result. So Kahneman's work is about system one and system two thinking. Now, system one thinking, we have these two types of thinking that are happening in our brain, two modes, if you will. Just like in a car, you can put it in drive mode or just keep it on regular or sports mode. Uh, it's the same thing with our brain. Now, system one, this is fast. This happens immediately. It's emotional. It's automatic. It's it's that gut feeling that like when Malcolm Gladwell wrote that book, Blink, it's that boom, what, what we think right away. And then there's system two thinking. This one's more logical, like analyzing data and whatnot. It's slower. It takes effort. Um, but it's that more logical side of our thinking. I get my, sorry, I lost my, my chat screen there for a second. I was <laughs> looking at what I had there. Um, so the, we have these two modes of thinking at the same time. And researchers have looked at which do we do more often? And give me in the chat field, I pulled my chat field out. Give me a guess. What percent of the time do you think is system one. System one, what percent of our thinking is most likely system one? That emotional, that fast, that automatic. Oh my gosh, you guys are so smart. I'm seeing, yes, I've seen those high numbers. And it can be high to, hard to quantify and people have, you know, kind of some different theories on it. But what they, what they most commonly land on Oh, and I just realized I have a little a little mark on my screen. Sorry about that. Uh, is ninety five percent? So, uh, <laughs> but the bulk of our thinking is that boom fast. We don't even you know it's as if we don't even think about it. We just go with our gut. That ninety five percent. But what I find even more interesting is the order of these thought processes. It's actually first comes in that automatic, it's easy, boom, that system one emotional response. And then we use system two to justify our system one thinking to others and to ourselves. So we tell ourselves we're logical, but we're not actually that logical most of the time, okay? And I thought it would be fun as we get to know these two systems to play a little game. So what I'm going to do is I want you to imagine that you uh, you have bought a car, okay? You have bought a car, here's your car, you've bought it. And I'm going to show you some reasons. I'm gonna show you one reason at a time that you might have for buying this car. And I want you in chat to please tell me if you think that reason is a system one thinking that just was fast, automatic, emotional, or a system two thinking that was slow. Oh, and I see that that second, that orange one should be system two. Sorry about sorry about that saying system one. So orange is system two, system one is system one is green. So I'm gonna give you a reason for buying the car. Okay. So first up, my first crush had this car. Do you think that's system one, emotional, or system two? Do you think that's methodical, slow, logical? Yep, you guys got it. System one. What about this one? Good resale value. What is that? System one or system two? Oh, you can hit you so fast. Look at that processing speed. You're correct. That would be system two. Slow, methodical. What about safety features? What is that? Safety features. One or two. There's safety features. This is a safe car. 
Very good. System two, logical. That, that's a valid reason, right? Uh, what about makes me feel cool? That car makes me feel so cool. Yay, system. That's system one as well. What about this next one? I associate that color orange with strength. It makes me feel like strength. What do you think? System one or two? Yep, you got it, system one. And lastly, what about you're getting a good price on it? It's a very reasonable price. Oh, you guys are so fast. I love how fast you all are. It's, I, I present on this topic elsewhere as well. It is usually a slower process. So we, we have such a smart crowd here. Yep, that would be that system too. And I, I'm sorry, I've got that little, that little glitch in my slide there. Um, so what's so funny is that we make those choices based on system one, but if anyone asks us why we bought the car, we're not telling them those green system one things. We're telling them, oh, it's such a smart buy and so on, because we, we like to feel logical. Um, now, how might this connect to people who have high IQ? Well, first of all, system one we have faster processing speed. That's part of our intelligent brains, right? It's fast. So, so that first response, that first reason, that comes zooming in fast. And then system two, when we're justifying it, we're really good at using that logic to justify things. So someone can have the most irrational reason or the most irrational behavior, but if they're super smart, they can really talk circles around someone on why they're actually so logical. So this is one for us to really be aware of and look out for um, having that high IQ. Um, and I would give a cautionary example of that. There was a preacher in the 60s in India Indiana, and he did he eventually came out to California, but he did uh, he did all of these great things to de desegregate Indiana, he desegregated a theater, a, a police station, a, an amusement park, churches. And he did so many great things. And out here in L.A., he had soup kitchens and job support for people. He was doing these incredible things, but he was gradually doing more and more horrific things to his congregation. But that slippery slope of doing those things that emotionally you maybe want to, but then justifying it even to yourself. Like he's thinking, yes, I'm controlling my congregation this way, but oh, that will lead to more funds and we can do you know, greater good. That justifying, this person I'm talking about is Reverend Jim Jones, the one that had everyone commit that mass suicide um, in South America, in the jungle. I mean, horrible. Yes, that we say drinking the Kool-Aid because he had them drink this flavor aid and, um, and injected them with... Um, with cyanide and whatnot. And so you think, you think, oh, he's a monster. And yes, he's a monster. Uh, but you can see how, I mean, he was incredibly intelligent at a very young age. He'd memorize vast passages from the Bible. And he, he was, he was very smart, but sadly he was so good at justifying his system one. So this is one to really look out for. Um, and that's a nice segue into cognitive dissidence. Um, have you heard of cognitive dissidence? Who's heard of cognitive dissidence? Is this one? It's not talked about too much. Oh, good. Some have. Oh, I love it because this is a big one. Uh, my favorite nonfiction book ever is actually about cognitive dissonance. It's called Mistakes Were Made, But Not By Me. Um, and what cognitive dissonance is, is that we all want to feel good about ourselves. We want to think we're moral and we have good values. We want to think we're correct. We've got the right answer. We've made the right choices. And we want to think we're smart. We're capable. We want to feel this way about ourselves. So when we encounter any evidence that we're not, like what if we slip up and we do something wrong to a friend or a partner? Or what if we've been thinking one way in our professional field and evidence comes out that we're wrong? Um, sadly, what usually happens, well, what ought to happen if we're purely logical, right? What happens is when we get the evidence, we will correct, right? We, we will adjust our thinking. Uh, it's like Piaget's assimilation and 
Accommodation. Accommodation would be changing the structure of what we're thinking for this new information. But sadly, that's not what usually happens. What usually happens is cognitive dissonance comes in, which is this disconnect between our feeling that we're moral, correct, and smart, and this evidence that we're not one of those things, right? Well, there's this dissonance. There's this, ooh, that doesn't really match up. So instead of getting rid of the thought that we're smart or correct, or that wouldn't feel very good, instead, we explain away the evidence. We go, oh, you know, that's not as important. Or, mm, you know, those researchers had a different agenda. Or we come up with some justification for it. And it's because of that dissonance going on in our brains. And this is impacting everything. Just like behavioral economics I talked about impacts everything. Same thing with cognitive dissonance. And I'll give you a quick story on this. Uh, Dr. Semmelweis, he was, uh, this was back in 1847. Um, he had discovered that basically doctors should be washing their hands. He worked in a maternity ward in Vienna, in Europe's pre you know, premier hospital of the time. And women had a better chance of surviving if they had a baby out in the streets than if they had a baby in this particular ward of the hospital. And he found the reason that ward was, he had a perfect experiment set up because people either went to one ward with the midwives or one ward with, with the doctors. And in, it was with the doctors that all all of these women were getting childbed fever, they were dying, their babies were dying, and it was a significant difference. And he discovered it tied to hand washing. These were the days of miasma theory where people didn't know about germs, they were just starting to make discoveries like the one Semmelweis did. And the doctors were teaching in the room that where the autopsies were. So they're working with his cadavers and then, you know, all this bacteria and dead flesh. And then they're walking into the maternity ward and they're the ones who are essentially killing these women and their children. Now, you can imagine when he came out with this data it was clear as day. He had a perfect experiment set up because it, it you know, you had your sa large sample size. They're randomly going in one ward or the other. He had such clear data. And when he actually had his, his medical students wash their hands, it dropped down to nothing, the deaths. So he had this indisputable data, but he became a laughing stock. None of the doctors accepted it. He lost his job. He never got a good job again. He actually died. Uh, this, this is quite sad. Um, he was in a mental institution and he actually died from a bacterial infection, which is exactly the kind of thing that he was trying to teach others about. And you think, why did they reject this information when they're used to looking at studies? They're used to looking at data. And this is clear as day. It's because of cognitive dissonance. If they accepted his data and his information, they would have to accept that they, who had chosen a profession to save lives, were the ones killing mothers and babies, which is horrific, right? It's the cognitive dissonance that caused them to reject the information. They had to think that they're moral, they're correct, and they're smart. And you think, well, how can this how can this, actually, I should even go back one. How can this be particularly important for those with high IQ? We're so used to being smart and it's often part of our identity. Um, and also if we have achieved a lot in a profession or even achieved a lot like in Dungeons and Dragons, maybe you're an amazing, you know, the dungeon master or game master, you're, you know, whatever area that you really excel in, you you have this, this identity, this reputation, and you, you don't want to lose that feeling that you're capable in that area and that you're smart. And for those of us where being smart and capable is a big part of our identities, it can be especially hard to admit when we're wrong. And it ties in quite a bit with something else we're most susceptible to, and that's confirmation bias. In fact, medical doctors are the, the prime example for confirmation bias, which is essentially you think you know the answer or you, you have what you think is the answer. And so you tend to ignore any evidence that doesn't support that. Um, and because you, you're confident that 
that you've got it right already. Um, in fact, medical doctors interrupt their patients on average 11 seconds into what the patient is saying, not 11 minutes, 11 seconds. And then they think they know what the treatment is and so on. Um, so it's, it is a big problem uh, for everyone who's on this talk here, those of us with high IQ, right? So just to kind of get the feeling of that, of what I'm talking about here, I want you to think for a moment, what's something you know a lot about? It might be a topic. It might be a fact that you know to be true. I want you to just think of that for a minute. What do you, you really know? And then I want you to envision, just imagine for me, Imagine somebody comes in with evidence that you're wrong, okay? Evidence you don't know about that topic or evidence that that fact is incorrect. Think of how you feel. It's not usually excitement. It's not usually, oh, now I get to rethink all this. It's, it's usually like, oh, it's this sinking feeling. It's not a favorable feeling. And, and that's why we, we like to avoid it. And we like to just stick with thinking that we're right, even when we're wrong. Um, and I thought it'd be fun to play another little game here. I'm going to have you use the chat field again. And I'm going to talk about four real life geniuses. Okay. Four real life geniuses. And I'm going to tell you a fact about each of them, right? But if one of those is false and the others are true. So three are true. One is false. And once I've described all four, I want you to Put in the chat field which the name of the person you think where their story is false, okay? So let's start out with Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, in, he had had his success with Apple, right? He's great. He was a great mind. And he found out about segways. He invested in them. He thought segways are the way of the future. They are going to redesign cities and towns around segways. This is, this is totally going to revolutionize everything we do. And very soon, this is going to happen soon. So I'm going to tell you that fact. I'm going to tell you three more, and then I'm going to have you guess which one is false. Now, Marie Curie, she won the Nobel Prize for physics. But then after that, and she was the first female, you know, to win that Nobel Prize. Uh, but then after that, she was she was doing some things in chemistry, but she was overly confident that she knew it all. And she blundered her experiment and she missed out on that second Nobel Prize. Then I'll talk about Albert Einstein when the, he had already had great, you know, with his, you know, quantum mechanics, physics and whatnot, great success. And so when the Great Depression hit, he he thought he knew, even though economics wasn't his area, he thought robots are doing this. They're replacing jobs, this, you know, assembly lines, whatnot. The, the reason for the Great Depression is robots. That's what Einstein declared. And then the last, last fun fact is Oppenheimer, he and a colleague were doing some work. They're playing around with, with actually with uh, Einstein's calculations. And they discovered some interesting things about black holes and about the gravitational pull that, you know, the gravitational field that even light couldn't, couldn't compete with. And they wrote a paper on black holes and Oppenheimer, he thought he knew it. He had it all figured out. He made all kinds of mistakes in that paper. And then he went and jumped on to other topics thinking he had it covered. Uh, when in reality, he made all sorts of mistakes when it was really a place ripe for discovery. And, and really that's what Hawking, you know, just built built his um, his greatest discoveries off of. And so I've, telling, I've told you four, which of these, is it Steve Jobs? Is it Marie Curie? Is it Einstein? Is it Oppenheimer? Which one of those is false? Three are correct and only one of them is false. Ooh, it's, I think it's a trick question. Actually, the answer is this, Marie Curie, she actually did win that second Nobel Prize. And to this day, she's the, the only person to ever win a Nobel Prize in two different, completely different categories. 
all of those other stories are true. They aren't talked about very often. So it's no, if you didn't know about them, that's, that's the norm because they had so many great achievements. We don't often talk about their failures, but, but each of those stories is true, uh, which is, you know, but you think they're so used to knowing all the answers, right? These are geniuses. So it's so easy after you've had successes to, to think, yeah. And the robots were more like assembly lines and what, and what not, but he used the word robots. Um, as, at, at least my, my source says so. Um, so, and I could send those to you too, if anyone wants the sources on those. Um, so next we're going to talk a little bit about identity, uh, such as our identity as Minsons, our identity as people who are smart. Uh, we all have many identities, like I'm a mom, I'm a runner, I'm a writer, I'm a nerd. You know, we have all these identities that pull at us, sometimes in conflicting directions. Um, but identity is a big pull on us. Um, and just to show you what a pull it is, I'd like to talk about a, a bit about this lovely lady. And does anyone recognize her? I'm imagining the lovely Nancy Reagan, um, who was such an advocate for so many, so many great causes. And one that she's especially known for is her Just Say No campaign to try to keep young people, and in particular teenagers, off of drugs, alcohol, uh, any substance abuse or use. Um, so they put a lot of money into the Just Say No campaign and they ran after school ads and all sorts of things. They put so, so much time and energy into it. And I'll give you an example. Like there was this one commercial where there was a young lady and she was a teenager. She left her apartment for school. She opens her apartment door. There's someone trying to sell her drugs. And she says, what do you think she says? She says, no. And then she walks, she leaves her apartment building. She walks down the steps to the street. She encounters someone there. He offers her drugs. She says, no. She proceeds on. She's offered drugs again. She gets to, she gets to her high school. There's a student there. Hey, you want to try these drugs? She says no, and so on. Now, how effective do you think that campaign was? What do you think happened to teen drug use? And I'd like you to please put in the chat field if you think drug use went up, if you think it stayed the same after those campaigns, or if you think it went down. Yay, you're all so smart. Yes, it went up. And up. I love when one of you said skyrocketed. And that's correct. Drug use amongst teenagers skyrocketed. And you think, how can this be happening? They're putting all this money into this. We've got the first lady herself behind this. How is this happening? It's because of identity. If you think of those ads and the social proof they were providing, those ads were telling teenagers, 100% of teens around you use drugs. Now, please don't take a photo, a screenshot of this and say this is what my presentation is about. This is not a true fact here. But this is this is what the what the teenagers were getting. It, the ads were tapping into their identity, which is the most one of the most powerful things we can tap into when we're trying to influence someone. And you think, well, what about smart individuals though, right? Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about some individuals who were politically active. They were thinkers, right? Um, there was a study where they, they looked at identity and they looked at Republicans, half of the study participants were Republicans and half of them were Democrats. So imagine you've got Republicans, you've got Democrats. And in this study, they showed the Republicans, this welfare plan or government assistance, we, we say today, but welfare plan that had so much money in it. I mean, the, anyone getting public assistance with this, they had a full ride through school. They had guaranteed jobs, full health care. There was so much money being poured into this welfare plan. And they asked those Republicans, what do you think of this welfare plan? Read it and tell us what you think. The Republicans loved it, loved the welfare plan. 
Then they showed the Democrats another welfare plan that doesn't really constitute a plan at all. It was empty. There was nothing in it. No money, nothing. It it couldn't even be called public assistance, right? And they had the Democrats in the study read this and they asked them, what do you think of that welfare plan? The Democrats loved it. And you might be thinking right now, what What's going on? That's not maybe my image of your average Republican or your average Democrat. Why did they like these plans that seem so different than, than what their party might, might typically prefer? And I want you to take a moment and chat and guess for me. What do you think the study participants were told about the plan right before they read it? They're given this plan. What do you think they were told about their plan? Oh, I see Kathy is on it. And Tim, good. Yep. And you guys got, they, you, and you've got it. They were told that that plan came from their own party. It, it was their identity. And what's so funny with, with identity is that we, and it's the same with these study participants. 100% of study participants, they thought, oh, no, I, I didn't do that, though. I, I wasn't swayed at all by the fact that I thought my party proposed that plan and it, and it wasn't the other party. They 100%. And they, they also, though, said, but I think the other party is swayed by identity. Identity. I think the the other guys they do that. They do that thing you're talking about. We're we're blind to the fact that we do this. We're so driven by identity. And then you know, for us being smart, we've got this smart identity, and we we tend to we tend to do this as well. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to talk about pattern recognition uh, for a bit. Now, I remember back when I was I began my career actually as a junior high school teacher or began to, uh, you know, my my first, I, I should say, full-time teaching position was a junior high school uh, English teacher. And we had an in-service where a guy came in and he, he had this slide up. And as soon as he put the slide up, I instantly thought, oh, how cute. There's a star in there. Oh, how, how fun. You know, there's there's a star. My brain just went straight to the fact that there was a star there. And then the guy, he's talking, he's talking. And I'm sure for a lot of you, you're looking at this image right now and you see the star. And he's talking and eventually he splits us in groups and we're, we're supposed to work together because team building and we're supposed to try to find the star. And I'm thinking, what? And of course, you don't, yes, and I'm sure you're all in this boat too, being a little different, being super smart and a little different, you don't always speak up about it. You know, sometimes you don't want to stand out. So you just kind of, hmm, you know, you're just wondering inside your head, why is nobody else, you know, this is this is easy, right? And then there's a star issue, but I'm, I'm sure lots of you, you already spotted it. Well, part of that that intelligent brain and that fast processing speed, it has to do with pattern recognition. If we know something exists, like say a star, we're going to notice it where it appears. And this can actually cause some problems. And it ties in a, a bit with the fact you know, we talked earlier about behavioral economics and how our brains are trying to be efficient. They're trying to be fast and efficient. In fact, Danny Kahneman's book on behavioral economics, uh, it's great. It's called Thinking fast and slow. You know, our brains, they're, they're trying to, trying to be speedy. Um, and so what we do is we have these things called heuristics that our brains are using all the time, even right now. So imagine you encounter, let's say, let's say this woman's a teacher and she encounters this little critter runs into the classroom. Well, her brain, that system one fast, right? Without even thinking about it, she doesn't know what this thing is, but the heuristic is this little shortcut that allows her to go, hmm, I've seen things that are similar and that makes me think that this, it might bite me, it might have disease, it might multiply rapidly. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna say keep that out of out of my classroom, right? So that's a heuristic. That's that's helpful, right? Our brains do these things because they do have a helpful side to them. However, sometimes the information we're operating on operating on is faulty. So again, we're pretending this woman's a teacher. Let's say someone says to her, I want you to recommend a student for your gifted program. 
Okay, because not all schools go just straight up by the test scores. Lots of them go by recommendations. And so she thinks, you know, she's got her her brain very quickly, automatic. She starts thinking of geniuses that she's seen in pictures, heard about. And most of the geniuses traditionally that have been talked about, they're white men. So suddenly she thinks this boy would be great for the gifted program. Now it could be this boy is gifted, but if she's jumping to that fast answer simply because of that faulty information that all geniuses have to be male or all geniuses have to be white, because we know that those aren't those aren't true, right? That then would be a bias. So it's like a heuristic gone wrong. So what happens to us is with our super fast, we've got fast brains, right? It's It also affects biases. So when we have these fast brains, those, uh, what we're, we're, Ah, studies have shown, and Adam Grant write, writes some about this, the great psychologist, Adam Grant, um, it, people with higher IQs, they actually tend to be more prone to stereotypes. So just like knowing about a star and then seeing the places that it shows up, same thing with stereotypes. We've heard something. We very quickly notice examples of it, but we're ignoring all the examples not of it. So we're actually more prone to stereotypes. We're actually, those with high IQs are more prone to conspiracy theories. Now, some conspiracies are surely true. They're surely facts. You know, there's a lot of people plotting behind the scenes in our world, right? So surely many are true, but many are also false. And if you if you go to a meeting of people who believe in a certain thing, like the earth is flat or whatever, people are often surprised to find they're very smart individuals, but they've got that smart brain that has that little piece of information and they suddenly notice all the things that support it. Now you throw in confirmation bias, which we're extra prone to, and the whole problem is compounded. So we talked about twice exceptionality. We talked about overexcitabilities that we all have. Um, and to two E, a bunch of us have, OEs, all of us have. And then we talk about these other sort of oops things that, that are happening all the time, simultaneously. Um, these these different, different quirks are happening. And so um, I, I do want to close um, with a quick story about the great Socrates. You all know Socrates. Well, when he was in prison, so later in, in his career, uh, one of his students went to see the Oracle of Delphi. And the student asked the Oracle, who is the smartest person in the entire world? And she said, Socrates. And the student famously went to Socrates and said, Socrates, Socrates, the Oracle of Delphi says you are the smartest person in the entire world. And Socrates says, how can that be? I know nothing. Now we know he didn't know nothing, but it's this that extra secret ingredient of why he was so smart, his intellectual humility. When we assume that there's so much more out there yet to learn, we take those high IQs and we take them even farther. So when we think of these quirks, they can hold us back, right? But if we approach everything with not only a knowledge of, of these funny things our minds do, that we're, we're not perfect by any means, and we approach it with this intellectual humility, then we take that gift of that high IQ and we really supercharge it and, and shoot for the stars or that Socrates level of intellect. And that concludes the the slide portion of the presentation but i love how active our audience is i've been seeing all kinds of questions fly through and i believe tim you're going to share some of those that we, that we could talk about and i'm happy to answer questions people might have And someone said, Carol asked, are all of these tendencies unique to gifted people? Okay, so um, yes and no. So it depends on which one. So the first ones, when we talked about twice exceptionality, 
The challenges are not unique to giftedness, but the term twice exceptionality is unique to giftedness. When it comes to the overexcitabilities, those are those are just for those with a, an IQ of 130 or above. It's not to say other people can't be emotional or intellectual or whatnot, but when it's at that that overexcitability mode and that's the reason they're that way, then it is it's unique to high IQ. And then those other things I was talking about, those that oops category, all of those things are universal. Everybody has those things happening. However, I picked those ones in particular because either they were worse for people with high IQ, for example, confirmation bias is famously worse for people with high IQ, or there's some aspect of it that we really need to be aware of with high IQ. For example, behavioral economics, the system one, we've got the faster processing. So that's that emotional reasoning, which it's not really reasoning, but you know that comes in real fast. And then our ability to justify it even to ourselves is heightened. And so we can really slip up more easily in that area. So there, the, those oops, that oops category was things that we just want to be especially careful of. Are the issues related to cognitive dissonance and the bias, as you mentioned, scale yes. or do not scale with IQ? Oh, um, I would say the biggest area in which they do, it has to do with achievement and identity. There's this uh, great book by Kuhn, uh, Scientific Revolution, uh, Revolutions, that uh, where we he goes through historically all these scientific revolutions, and you see time and time again, when somebody is new to a field, it's easier for them to speak up and not have that cognitive dissonance. Um, the authors of my favorite book on this topic, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me, it describes cognitive dissonance as a pyramid, where when we're at the top and we kind of get into a field or we kind of know something about, we we can very easily accept information that we're wrong about it. But the more we get into that field, it's like sliding down the pyramid. It's harder and harder to accept the information. And what we find is, for example, Dr. Simmelweis, he was actually, he was a foreigner. He was from outside the country. So it made him a little bit out of an outsider. He was also a younger doctor, right? And he, and he was, he was not Austrian. He was not, you know, from the country where he was. He was, I believe, Hungarian. Um, and it was easier for him to speak up because he's a new doctor, right? I think he was maybe like 24 years old. He was, he was quite young. Um, and so it's easier to speak up when we're newer to something. So then when you take someone with a high IQ, not that, you know, I have a whole other presentation about how often, how, how often we maybe are not high achievers, even though we have this great ability. Um, so it's not necessary. We don't, we're not necessarily high achievers, you know, if we have a high IQ, but it is quite common, right? I mean, you can't, you can't be Albert Einstein and not have a high IQ. You can't be Marie Curie and not have an, a high IQ. So, so people who are in these positions to either accept the new information that they were wrong or not accept it, they've achieved quite a bit, right? They're at the pinnacle. Or if we're talking about that pyramid, they've slid quite a ways. And so it's more of a threat to them when there's information that everything they've built their career on is wrong. They might have written papers that are wrong. They might have spoken out on things that are wrong. And it becomes harder and harder for them to admit wrongdoing. Almost like a politician, you know, they've got this big reputation they built up and then there's evidence they've done something wrong and you see lots of denial, you know, on, on both sides of, of part of the party aisle. So, um, so it becomes, you know, it's more high IQ and achievement, but also high IQ when that's a big part of our identity, that we're smart, that we're capable. Remember, that's a piece of cognitive dissonance that we are, we like to think of ourselves as smart and capable. And for somebody like, like I was, I was a really awkward, ugly child, you know, to, to be honest. And so, so looks, appearance, that's not part of my identity, but my brain sure is, right? If someone were to suggest that I'm not smart, it's a bigger threat to me. Where if someone says, ah, Jenny, I hate your makeup. I don't care, right? It's not my identity, right? Um, so we we can really, you know, if with cognitive dissonance, those are the areas that, that tend to be um, where high IQ individuals have their pitfalls. 
Um, Valerie is asking, can you say something about our tendency to doubt ourselves? Oh, I love that, like imposter syndrome. And yes, and that's a big one, especially for, for women in particular or from any group that's been traditionally less less involved in, a, in an area. Um, that often, I think, coincides a lot with the overexcitabilities of, and I'm, I'm not saying by any means women are more, more emotional. I'm not saying that, but if you're, if you are sensitive and you're more likely to think of the sensitive side of things, and you have that intellectual overexcitability where you're an overthinker, like how many of you have trouble sleeping? Cause you can't switch the, you can't switch your brain off. I mean, to total insomnia, right? I've struggled with it for so long because we can't turn it off. And those overexcitabilities in particular that those with a 130 and up IQ, you know, uh, often have, those can really feed into that doubting ourselves. Have I really done enough for this? Am I really qualified? And, and often that's what does hold back some high Q, IQ individuals from even stepping out there, often feel a failure too. So we see imposter syndrome, feel a fear of failure and so on. So um, we, we definitely can uh, doubt ourselves more even, and even when we do achieve, you know, it's, it's very easy to walk into a room and, you know, maybe something just triggers us a little bit and we think, oh, maybe I shouldn't be here. Or maybe I remember when I, when I first taught at Cambridge, I felt like that too. I kept thinking, did do they, do they know it's me? Even to where I, I showed up for class, right? We'd already been doing the planning and structural planning and I show up and I'm still feeling like, is this really going to happen? You know, it's, it's so common for us to doubt ourselves, especially if we're overthinking it or especially if we're, we're quite sensitive. Okay. Brad asked, um, to, could you say something about the different types of intelligence? Oh, oh, oh gosh. You know, that's not, I wouldn't say that's my main area to where I, I would feel like, I, I would feel like I'm not the best expert to speak on it. But, uh, but I will say um, there are so many, you know, we see like someone can be a musical genius, but maybe can't read. There, there are so many ways in which someone is genius in one area and not necessarily in another. And I often give the example, I've, I've been divorced twice, right? And I'm one of those people, like you could tell, you could sell me swamp land in Florida. I'm, I always joke that I'm not streetwise, I'm street unwise, <laughs> but, but obviously I'm a mincin, I've got a high IQ, I, you know, a, a high achiever. Uh, but there are areas where I just have blind spots. Oh, someone tells me something and I, I can be very naive. Uh, so I'm I'm not smart in that area, um, and we have people, of course, who are. Um, I my I have a, a one of my best friends. She barely graduated high school. We didn't even know that she was going to graduate, but she is so streetwise. It is it is just staggering, um, and we we see that with with music, with art, with all sorts of different areas, the different intelligences. Um, I have a question. Um, is there a way to distinguish cognitive dissonance from people actually lying despite knowing that something is wrong? Oh gosh, that's that's a good one. And I, and I'm sure that often happens too. You know, especially I use politics as an example earlier. You know, we've seen that a lot. And and again, we see the we see the lying more often in probably the same areas where we see cognitive dissonance more often when someone has a lot to lose, right? They built their whole career saying, you know, this is the way black holes work, or this is the way gravity works, or this is, you know, the, the planets are revolving around the earth. They've got a lot to lose when evidence comes out that they're wrong. So, so I'm sure we've, I'm sure we see that a lot as well. And I, um, that would be a fascinating talk. I think from somebody who understands how to catch when someone's lying, me not being streetwise, I'm not very good at that catching when someone's lying. Um, but I'm sure that that's the case a lot of the time too. And it's an, I'm, glad you brought that brought up that question because it is important for us to keep that in mind when you know maybe we even think someone's lying and they're not they're just they're lying to themselves right which is part of cognitive dissonance when we we lie to ourselves um i have a question about do men and women use the type one and type two 
thinking differently. A woman friend once said to me, for women, it's all emotion. A man would never say that. <laughs> you know, it is so funny. Before, when we got into this Zoom, you know, the first three of us, and we were chatting before everybody else got in, we were talking about topics being taboo and, you know, if it's, you know, something people will touch or not. And differences between the brains of women and men, they're one of those topics. And there's this, um, oh, this great book. What was it called? It was... Oh, not, I never thought about, I could pull it up, I'll, I'll put it on that list. There was even a researcher who, um, I think it was a woman, she had done all of her research or she had a, she had her career. It was basically, it was great minds. Each one wrote a different chapter, a very short chapter. It was these great minds and they talked about something that they had pivoted on, you know, something that they had changed their mind about and why and how. And there was a researcher where she, she had, um, the basis of, of her research was all about the brains being the same. Uh, but then she finally had to say, hmm, there are some differences in the brains. I think it often gets um, exaggerated. I, I think uh, my own personal opinion, because there are all sorts of expert opinions out there on this. So, so I won't speak on everyone, but it's a topic I'm interested in. So when there is something new out, I do look at it. And the, the feeling I get is that there are differences, but I don't think the differences are as vast as um, as some people some people think they are. But I think you know so much of it is society and the way that you're raised and you know more more environmental. But but there are definite there are some definite differences. I I'm in the opinion of you know some experts agree, some experts disagree. So um, there there is that's one of those topics where people people are a little scared of it. Different 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 perspectives. So in time we'll we'll find out more and more. But but that's my own. That's my conclusion. Thank you very much. Oh, thanks, Bill. And then I have Brad. You have your hand raised. Uh, yes. My question is uh, about your OE. Uh, I know there's a, the Minnesota multiphasic test. Is there a similar test that identifies these OE characteristics in individuals where they could take this and say, oh, yes, based on my responses, this is what I am? Oh, I love that question. That, so there isn't that I know of. However, uh, I wrote a book on that topic and I, or, or I wrote a book on gifted education. You know, that was an aspect of it. And I put, it was a, it was a book for ASCD's series for busy teachers, busy educators. And so it was this short book series where it was just like, give me the facts, you know, real, real fast and to the point. And so I created these bulleted lists for each of those, like, boom, here's this one, here's this one, here's this one. And you could take that. And I even made it, I think a handout once. I'll, I'll look for that and I'll put it in with what I'm sending Judy about the chat sources because um, uh, it can, in my mind, be used as a self-assessment to look at them and go down, not to the extent that, you know, three points in this column means this, not, not to that extent, but, you know, if you're checking off a bunch in this area and you're checking off a bunch in this, you, you'll really get the feel for, okay, that's probably me because you can have it and not have all of the traits of it. For example, psychomotor, I would, uh, one thing I mentioned was that it manifests itself physically and or verbally. For me, it's both. I talk so much. I have trouble interrupting people and I am always on the go. I was you know, such a hyper child. I'm always moving. But for other people, maybe that person sits still, but their mouth just goes, or maybe it's the other way around. They're quiet, but they're always on the move. So there can be aspects that maybe don't apply to you. Or for example, the sensual overexcitability, there are um, some aspects of that. Like um, for example, some people, with textures, uh, you'll you'll see this a lot. Like I used to oversee uh, Mensa's gifted youth program in, in Orange County, in my county. And it was really common with the gifted kids 
to hate anything slimy like spinach or mushrooms, you know, is that texture thing. My niece is like that. She's brilliant. And I'm fine with those things. I'm fine with textures like that, eating them, but, but others aren't, you know, so there, there are some where you won't check it off, but that doesn't mean you don't, you know, don't have the overexcitability if you have the bulk of it, you know, I would say. So I'll, I'll put that together as a little bit of a, as long as you know, it hasn't, it hasn't been tested, you know, there's no, <laughs> it hasn't been put there, you know, but, but I think it's really fun. And it, and it's a nice reminder too, of the different qualities of each. And well, um, yeah. I was just going to say, I'd be, you know, Mensa has this practice test that they offer to non-members. I think it'd be interesting to offer in parallel with that a similar type test. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that. And it has, there's uh, Victoria Bernhardt, the researcher has, uh, one of the ones is a proponent of the fact that these can actually be markers that help you identify a gifted a, a gifted individual, you know, and it's great. Like, for example, my, my book on this is for teachers, uh, public school or private, you know, uh, secondary and elementary teachers. And it's pointing out because there are a lot of students who slip through the cracks because maybe they are, maybe they're just bored by what the teacher's saying and they're not testing well. And, or maybe they have test anxiety, which is quite common, right? You know, we get that, especially with the emotional overexcitability and maybe we don't test so well. And so kids slip through the cracks and they can be great ways to spot a gifted kid. Like if I have a friend that's, you know, talking about a child and starts to say, and I'll start to ask some questions, you know, along these lines and boom, I say, you know, I think your child's probably highly gifted. And maybe that's, you know, maybe what's actually happening is the child is unengaged in class or, you know, these, uh, these other things. So I, I think that'd be great. I love that idea, Brad, that, yeah, that'd be awesome. Oh, we I see have, it. We have Grayson. What? Your question, Grayson. Um, yeah, uh, I want to ask, uh, how can overexcitabilities mix together, uh, either beneficially uh, or pathologically? Because it seemed like in your uh, slides, you only talked about um, negative things, mostly, yeah. like uh, the way people negatively respond to being overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, what are, I would assume there are also benefits to that, like that could deliver breakthroughs or, uh, you know, uh, insights. Totally. I mean, look at, for example, um, the overexcitability of psychomotor, which is often misdiagnosed as ADHD. Sometimes they don't also have ADHD. Um, but think of Tony Stark and El Shea, everything they accomplished. And I mean, just prolific, right? And it's that energy, that never stopping. I mean, that intellectual overexcitability. Think of these great minds that, that didn't just put down those formulas or those equations, but just kept pushing through the night, it's because their minds were insatiable. That's that intellectual overexcitability. The emotional overexcitability, think of why Temple Grandin did everything that she did. I mean, she surely had that also that emotional overexcitability of, of wanting to make a change, wanting to do something. Octavia Butler, despite having dyslexia, won the MacArthur Genius Grant for, for writing, you know, is, is incredible. You know, in, in each of these cases, that overexcitability and, and Kanye, for all his flaws, the things he has, you know, that musical genius and design genius for all of their achievements, you really can tie, tie it back to that overexcitability playing a role in that. So yeah, they, they're quirks, but they're also superpowers. They're both things at the same time. Just like neurodiversity, you know, we're wired differently, but it allows us to to con contribute something different to society and to our professional fields. Come out with another uh, another uh, chunk of research about left and right brain with some fascinating discoveries uh, that it's not so much that we're left or right brain. It's just like system one, system two, where these things are happening simultaneously. Uh, our left brain is very action oriented on getting an answer on something very specific, almost like a bird is going to dive in and pick up that seed. 
Whereas our right brain is more holistic and thinking about the big picture. Um, and it has just like the bird has to also be aware of her surroundings and whatnot. And it's uh, really kind of upended uh, research into left and right brain. And it's, it's really interesting stuff. And um, that's, that's just been coming out lately. So I, yeah, lo love that stuff. And what's so nice is it, it complements that system one and system two and, and others have characterized it different ways as well. Well, even Plato talked about system one and system two thinking, but he talked about it in terms of um, there's a charioteer riding a chariot um, of, and there are two, actually he had two horses. One of them had to do with like lust and, and uh, thirst and hunger. But then the other one was that those emotions, right? That, that system one, that's just going. And then you've got this charioteer just kind of hanging on. And then more recently, John, John Height, it's, it's spelled H A I D T. Um, he came out with a, a book, uh, the righteous mind about um, he, he calls it the elephant and the rider where system one really has all the power. And that's the elephant. That's that emotion. That's really, you know, the, and then you've got this rider just clinging on, which is that logic and that that system too that's that's less um less in control so to speak yeah that's been coming out lately too how does the right left brain thing hold up for left-handed people oh gosh yes see that's what's so interesting too um is the control, you know, the control of one side controls the other side of the body and so on. And, and there's a, there's a lot of evidence and um, some, some of it just circumstantial or, you know, what people are noticing here and there about themselves that there's a lot of evidence that people who are left-handed tend to be more creative. And, and there, I, I do think that there is an argument for that, knowing that it's diff it's different wiring, right? They're they're just wired. It's it's just flipped for them. Um, but when it comes to the left and right brain, those other aspects that especially the especially the findings that are just coming out right now, I wouldn't know enough about how that ties in with left handedness. But I, I do find it quite interesting when you look at how many successful creatives out there are left-handed. I know, you know, the left-handed people that I know in my life are incredibly creative. And, you know, I, I do think there are some superpowers that come with that or some differences. Um, so that, in again, it it's that that neurodiversity where they're wired a little differently, but it, it does come with it some advantages as well, even though scissors and other things, notebooks, you know, aren't always designed in the best way for them. Do you see another hand from Brad? Do you want to say something again, Brad? Well, since you brought up the left-handed people, I had a professor in undergrad school wrote with both hands simultaneously across the chalkboard. It was the most amazing thing. No one could keep up with his uh, taking notes with his lectures. It's funny you say that I was ambidextrous as a child and it it got out of me, but I can still, I can write the same thing in two directions like that. And I think at one time on one of those Mensa forums, I think someone, or maybe it was somewhere else, but there was somewhere where a Mensa asked, hey, how many of you are ambidextrous or had this or had, and it was, I was pretty floored by how many people were saying, you know, that, that they were, or at least use, you know, they're out of practice, but that they used to, you know, just use them interchangeably. And I, I do think that has to do with, I'm sure maybe some external pathways that also assist IQ. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I do think there's a connection there. Thank you very much, Jenny. This has been a great talk. We've all really enjoyed it. And uh, what can I say? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I, I love that you offer these talks and um, and I, it's just been an honor and everyone's participation and engagement. I so appreciate and, and the things people were expressing. It's It's been a real pleasure. So thank you so much.